There may not be a game on Saturday, but D.Y. and I are here with another edition of the KSO Show on a Friday, getting set for the weekend of college football. Despite the Wildcats being idle, they have to wait a little bit to get their game with Oklahoma State next week to resume the season. But four games are in the books, 33% of the season, one-third, whatever you want to say about it. The Wildcats are already uh, getting closer to the midway point than the start of the season now when you look at how things stand. So we will go over a lot of different things in today's show. We will hit on the first four games of the year, maybe how expectations have changed just despite what we've seen, and then uh, also get to the, the standard Friday stuff with our best bets and a look around the Big 12, which is everybody playing Big 12 opponents this week. No more non-conference games in the league. However, uh, obviously not a full weekend with K-State and Oklahoma State on the bye, but we will uh, get to it all and do it for you on a Friday, just like any other regular day. So uh, that is Derek Young of K-State Online joining me. I am Mason Voth of K-State Online, and we are ready to get going on this Friday edition of the KSO Show. Well, let's let's just start right now, kind of quick uh, synopsis of the season for the Wildcats. They're three and one as they hit the bye week. They've been banged up a little bit. Some guys have played through some injuries that have maybe kept them from being what was expected of them. Other guys have had to sit out because of the injuries, and it all kind of led to they beat up on two teams that they were easily better than. You got a little bit of a tricky road game against a team that obviously won that game really, really bad, and you dropped it to Missouri by a last-second field goal, which is more than unfortunate the way that things ended up playing out. And uh, then they were able to rebound and get the uh, first win in Big 12 play against UCF. So – uh, based off of all of that, how would you assess the first four games of K-State season, and how different is it from what maybe you would have expected uh, entering the year? Well, I expected, to, I expected probably four, no, but I also expected that Mizzou game to be much more difficult than the typical fan, and it kind of unfolded that way. Now there were still opportunities to win that game, and ultimately they lost because they. They didn't get a defensive play when they needed it the most, and they didn't get an offensive play when they needed it the most. But if you take away that little detail, and that's pretty important detail, of course, the defense responded and kind of settled in, and the offense also put up some pretty big numbers considering what Mizzou typically allows. So when I kind of take that into consideration, like the defense kind of figured it out, the offense overperformed just about every, what, what everyone does against Missouri. That does tell me that the Tigers probably played above their skis a little bit. Or maybe Missouri's a little bit better than we thought they were um, this year as well. They're still sitting here undefeated. They'll probably be undefeated here in three days too because I mm -hmm. don't think that they should have any issue with Vanderbilt. And again, a little bit uh, of fool's gold, but it's not going to look like a terrible loss because in a few days Missouri's going to be 5-0. Yeah, so, I mean, I think yeah. I think that's yeah. one, one thing to kind of keep perspective on with the the Missouri loss and everything that's going to come out of that. I mean, Missouri, you, you look at their schedule and and how things are going to play out for them. I mean, they are going to be five and zero. Uh, I would be stunned if they they didn't get to that. I mean, losing to Vanderbilt would, uh, you know, it'd be a little bit of a shock to the system. But you look around the rest of it too. I mean, um, it, the SEC East maybe for the first time in a long time might be tougher than the SEC West, but there's still some games on their schedule that look fairly winnable. And this is a Missouri team that realistically right now, you're probably looking at and thinking they could win eight games this year, maybe more. Um, it, it's going to be tough. They would have to basically win the games they're supposed to win. And then, you know, you have the losses that, you, that you're supposed to lose. But this is a Missouri team that is a little bit better. They were highly motivated. And, uh, you know, K-State had some deficiencies in that game. Now, the good news is some of the issues there, it seems like they've maybe corrected a little bit or have gotten on the right track. And, you know, the we knew that the secondary was going to have a, a struggle with some of the talented receivers Missouri had. That was obviously the case. And fortunately for K-State, it's a non-conference game that even though it would have been nice to be unbeaten still, I mean, it, it tanked them all the way from 15 to, to out of the top 25 but it doesn't mean a lot in the grand scheme of things. And so it's better to have that kind of wake-up call and learning moment for a bunch of the young defensive backs uh, in that game as opposed to having it happen, say, last weekend against Central Florida. 
my bad, UCF. I don't want to offend any of the, the folks down in Orlando. Yeah, I mean, and that's a really good win. You basically beat UCF by 20, even though it wasn't always pretty. And and there were still moments that probably had you nervous, just like there was moments against Missouri that had you nervous, and it, and it proved to be that way. <laughs> and there was even, you know, the second quarter probably had people's nerves going a little bit against Troy. So they haven't put a full game together yet. I don't know if they've really put a full half together yet. Yeah, And they've still been – fairly dominant outside of the Missouri game. So I think what all in all, you're probably disappointed with the Missouri loss, but generally should feel comfortable about the product to this point and wonder how much more they can do while knowing there is some areas that need cleaned up or addressed where some, in, in some ways, maybe not have, you know, a viable or obvious solution that, Pratt's being the passing explosiveness. You you wonder what's going to go on there. Now, the easy and viable solution would be Keegan Johnson becomes Keegan Johnson, and, and you probably figure that out in a hurry. I don't know that R.J. Garcia is necessarily going to be that explosive dude. I wouldn't say he really gets out of the gates really super fast or anything of that sort, but Phil Brooks has been solid. Jaden Jackson has been solid. Maybe they need to scheme up ways to get him more involved and give him even more chances. I, I think, you know, in ways the, the explosiveness can also be addressed by just having Garrett Oakley out there. It sounds like he can really be uh, a weapon similar to Ben Sennett and you have a double tight like that. I, I think that's dangerous. And maybe DJ Gins is starting to get going too, because if you're that explosive on the ground, like he was with over 200 yards and four touchdowns, you're going to have opportunities even without explosive playmakers to be explosive through the air just because the defense has to account for your running game, which took a step forward because the offensive line has really improved a lot in the last two games. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things in the Missouri game that, that did take a step forward was the, they they probably played their best game against Mizzou, at least in terms of you know giving some time. Now, the run game still struggled a little bit there, but then we saw it take off, obviously. And I think part of that, too, was um, – Colin Klein and the coaching staff had to make sure they were comfortable with trusting the run a little bit more. And that comes by seeing a stronger performance from the offensive line and then feeling like, okay, we can repeatedly go to, I mean, what it ended up being 30 carries last week against UCF for DJ Giddens. Um, I'd have to go back and look, but I'm not sure in the first three games that the K state running backs hit 30 carries at least, you know, um, in, in, in the the part of the game that mattered non-garbage time touches so uh, I think it shows some growth there and th- they're getting better but Chris Kleiman said it earlier in the week like there there is still room for them to improve uh, still you know they still expect them to get better and I think that should be the expectation of everybody else as well this team still I think has a little bit more of the tank that they can give that we had not seen yet it's just going to take some time for them to be able to you know find it and unlock it but it, it will come, at least I believe it will. That, yeah, you're probably not going to love this defense until like the last quarter of the season, I would yeah. say, because the, the, the explosives are probably not going away just because it's a result of being young and inexperienced. And you're young and inexperienced <laughs> until you play enough games and just haven't played enough games. Yeah. The good news on that is you look ahead for K-State the next – well, the next third of the season, the next four games, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, TCU, and Houston. Only one of those teams, TCU, has shown the ability to kind of be explosive this year offensively. Like they, TCU in every single game has looked good on offense. You know, even the Colorado loss, they put up 42 points. The offense is not the reason they lost that game. But Oklahoma State, not a great offense. I will be interested to see what Texas Tech looks like this weekend with I, I, without I, I, Tyler Shuck. I think they can still be explosive in offense. They're just going to be a little turnover prone. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I I don't. I still don't buy in. I think you. I think you're still too kind on Oklahoma State. Well, this year, I, well, I think Bear Morton's pretty solid. He just if he wouldn't throw the yeah. ball to the other team so much, he's really not bad. Yeah. No. I I just think it's going to take some time for him to adjust. So fortunately, I mean for K State that that game is you know coming that, up on the schedule quicker than others. Because you're right. The teams that play Texas Tech at the end of the year, Baron Morton out there, he'll be a much different guy. It's basically going to be 
two years of on-the-job experience for Baron Morton, whereas if you're K-State, you're still getting him with a, a couple of games under his belt and not too many. And then Houston is Houston. Like, that's a home game. It's probably going to be an 11 a.m. kick. We yeah. know Chris Kleiman dominates 11 a.m. kicks against bad teams, so I would uh, not expect anything too hairy out of that situation. You just never know what Houston you're going to get. Like the the yeah. the range of, of their performance, caliber performance is pretty wide this year. Yeah, and I think that's what we'll talk about it later. But Houston Texas Tech uh, is one of the more intriguing matchups in the Big Twelve this weekend, just because at one of the teams is going to kind of show us their true colors here, or at least what we should, you know, build off of moving forward. Uh, other notes on the first half, who would you give a fir- uh, first four games offensive and defensive MVP tag to? I, you know, I, I did, I did Bosco's boys with Scott Wildcat yesterday, and it was tough thinking of somebody offensively that I would give it to, because even though the offense has not been bad by any means, it's tough to, to select one individual player uh, on, on what's gone on there because I think that some well, of the players offensively, the, you, you expect better of them still. Let me pick before you tell me who you picked. Okay. So we don't contribute to each other in any <laughs> way. Um, DJ Giddens is a consideration, but I, I, I don't know if the consistency or body of work was always there. And – it's going to make my pick probably sound a little uh, hypocritical because of that offensive line, slow start. I mean, technically, Cooper Beebe was still pretty good. You mm-hmm. could pick him yeah, and, and probably not be wrong. Will Howard, I think, has just had his B game this year. And maybe B game is good enough to be your MVP. I wouldn't judge someone if that was the case. Jaden Jackson, he's kind of been a first half man, not necessarily a second half man. RJ Garcia just had the one game. Phil Brooks has probably been their steadiest player. So if you wanted to go that route, I wouldn't criticize it. But I'll go with Ben Sennett because he's had multiple big games. In the game where he was non existent, it was because they were so scared of him that they let everyone else beat them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I think that's I think that's probably probably fair. Um I I lean towards I lean towards Will Howard still. Um just because I look around and I can I can find the flaws in, in everything with, with the offense. And that's why putting up forty four last week against UCF and still feeling like they didn't play well, that's that's a pretty good sign for K State of what's to come. But you know, Ben Sennett, I, I think about he's been good this year. He's been at, you know, close to as advertised and has had some moments, but he's also had some really criti- like cr- critical and crucial drops uh, in some moments that, you know, it's not fair because other guys have had bad moments just at different times in the game. But uh, I, I would like to see a little bit more steadiness out of him probably. And I think it'll come. I just think it's been bad luck. And like I said, other guys drop the ball second play of the game with 1333 on the clock and you don't think about it again fortunately for him he's had a couple on some critical like second and third downs that would have moved the sticks and kept the drive alive fortunately in the UCF game it didn't cost them will howard has the benefit of yeah he can throw the ball and he can also run the ball uh, but i mean will howard has already accounted for um six non-passing touchdowns this year. So what, he, how many touchdowns? That's eight touchdowns he's run. So he's accounted for 14 of K-State's touchdowns this season. And you're right. He's had his B game. He's been a little bit off. The accuracy is better overall compared to last year. He's risen it by basically six points. So he's gone from below 60 to um, close to 66% completion percentage, which was something that he needed to take a step forward on. It's just some of the deep balls haven't been there connection-wise. I think that probably says more about the guys that are going out and, and chasing down the deep balls this year. Uh, last year, it was very veteran guys like Malik Knowles and Cade Warner. And this year, you're dealing with a bunch of dudes that are you know seeing real action for the first time in their careers. Like Keegan Johnson got it for a brief second there, but it, it wasn't very long. Jaden Jackson hasn't seen a ton of it. And Phillip Brooks is never going to be like a 25, 30-yard down the field big play type of guy. He's always going to be the... I'm going to catch six balls in a game and I'm going to total 35 yards by the end of the game. And that's fine. You need guys like that. And that's kind of what Cade Warner was his first year at K-State. So 
I just think it's probably still Will Howard. I, you're not wrong. I mean, if you were just picking who's been the best player on offense for K-State, it's easily Cooper Beebe. Um, there's no doubt about that. It's just tough to give an award like this, you know, even though it doesn't mean anything to an offensive lineman, especially when, especially when the unit around you has had questions. It, unfortunately for you, it's like uh, you, we talk about baseball is like the ultimate team sport. It is also a reflection like, yeah, Mike Trout gets penalized by the fact that his team sucks. Cooper Beebe gets penalized by the fact that the offensive line has not been up to the level that was expected of them. I like how you use Mike Trout and just completely ignore Shohei Hutani. Well, <laughs> I mean, I could have used either of those guys. I mean, I'll, I'll throw both dude. of them in there, you know? I mean, that's a conversation for another day. But, boy, is that amazing that you can have two players of that caliber for multiple seasons. Yeah and not even make the playoffs. Yeah, the two best players that we've seen in however long, and it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's that's incredible. I just, I go Will Howard still, and I I, I think that the, uh, the angst and the disappointment in Will Howard has gone a little overboard, and I think people, it's, it's always easier to blame the quarterback. Like, he touches the ball every single play, and when something's going wrong, He's the individual that you can say, ah, nah, that quarterback, I uh, got to do this, got to do that. Quarterbacks are always asked to make up for the deficiencies elsewhere on the team. Will Howard has had to do that in some ways. I will say, I mean, he, the one really bad throw that I thought he made the, last weekend was the ball to Garrett Oakley that was overthrown a little bit and couldn't be caught. Should have been completed. Like, Garrett Oakley was, was wide open. That's the kind of wide open you're looking for, and he didn't hit it. Some of the other ones, whatever, a little touchy. Uh, inside of this real quick, before we move on to kind of the other side of the ball, we're four games into this season. Will Howard draft eligible after this year. The expectation going into the season by a lot of people was, yeah, if he plays anywhere close to how he did last season and that size, everything else he's got going for him, he will leave for the NFL. He'll get drafted. Are you still under the belief that Will Howard gets drafted if he, he leaves this year and that he will leave this year? I tend to think so just because I, I think about all the quarterbacks that got drafted last year. I mean, you had guys like Sean Clifford from Penn State and uh, just everyone hoping that they, like, you know, luck into someone like Brock Purdy. And, you know, in the, in the final round, you saw the, the the reaction to that. The other teams all tried to do the same thing the following season. I don't, none of them will probably work, but they all took that step. So you'd think someone would at least take a step on Will Howard I think he's only going to get better this season because I think Kansas State's going to only get healthier at receiver, you would think. And now you have Garrett Oakley to kind of supplement the passing game as well. Here, here's my thing. I like it's a tough subject to navigate. I know we're discussing it a little bit on the message board as well with the Will Howard Avery Johnson kind of uh, dynamic. And can you really do that for two full seasons? I don't know. That'll be something that the Kansas State coaches would have to manage should Will Howard return. My opinion on it, those things typically have a way of sorting themselves out. Sometimes health plays into that. And it, and if Kansas State's competing for at the end of the season and it's the final game and they're still within reach of going to Arlington, it probably meant Will Howard was good enough mm -hmm. and he's probably going to go to the NFL. And if it's not, and they're struggling to make it to Arlington or not even competitive to get to Arlington, then we'll probably see more and more Avery Johnson as the year goes on, or they're not in even close to going to Arlington because Will Howard's already hurt. And, and I don't know what that would mean for the following year either. It's a tricky situation. It's a tough dynamic. It's it's not even one to really speculate because you're just going to be reckless if you do. Um, but those are the angles that all could go into play. But – I'll harken back to my main point and takeaway there. These things that typically have a, a way of working themselves out. If Kansas State is playing, who's the final game of the year? Iowa State, Farmageddon yeah. in Manhattan, and they they are still within striking distance of going to Arlington. It probably means Will Howard was good enough all season to be an NFL draftable quarterback. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you look at it right now. I don't think anything Will Howard has done this year probably changes the way that the NFL scouts are looking at him like they did at the end of last year, where they're probably still looking at him and saying, okay, because you can go through and just pick out guys that we know have been drafted. This version of Will Howard is better than 
any version of Skylar Thompson, or certainly the Skylar Thompson at the end of his career, right? Like, and that guy got drafted. And that's not a slight to Skylar, but it, it just is kind of how I go. I mean, this version of Will Howard is better than Brock Purdy, I would think. And Brock Purdy got drafted, albeit at the very end of the draft, but he, he got drafted. I mean, you, you go down the list last year of guys that got drafted. Um, you know, you start after Stetson Bennett, basically, because you get why that was done. It was a dumb move by the Rams, but it was done. Uh, Aiden O'Connell from Purdue, Clayton Toon of Houston, Dorian Thompson Robinson of UCLA, Sean Clifford, like you mentioned, Jaron Hall from BYU, Tanner McKee from Stanford, and Max Duggan, like, Tanner McKee, very clearly a guy that got picked because he's 6'6", 230, and it's because of the raw quarterback skills that are there, not because of anything he accomplished at Stanford. Especially, there's probably more similarity between Will Howard and Max Duggan than we think. And and if Max Duggan's getting drafted, who's a quarterback that ran well without being overly athletic, Will Howard's a quarterback that runs well without being overly athletic. And they both, Will Howard might even be a better thrower than Max Duggan. So yeah, yeah. And I mean, you you can go back and look the the year prior of the quarterbacks that were taken. I mean, you got you had a guy from South Dakota State get drafted, uh, and then Skyler and Brock Perl were were the other guys. I mean, Sam Howell, Bailey Zappi, Matt Corral. Um, it wasn't like the most mind blowing group. Desmond Ritter, um, all of those guys. So I, I just think it's. Uh, it's something to keep in mind. I think that's still on pace for happening. I think things would have to go disastrously wrong for Will Howard to not end up being drafted and and not leaving after this year for that opportunity because what we've learned, and, and K-State fans should learn this more than anybody, for every like Alex Barnes that you can point to and say probably should have stayed for another year because things clearly did not work out in the NFL – there's like five, six, seven other instances where guys left early at K-State in that same time frame where it worked out well for them. And when the opportunity is there, you go do it. You start collecting the the NFL money no matter how it comes in and hope that you end up in the right spot. I mean, obviously a little different, but Skyler ended up in a good spot. He got to start games and, and start a playoff game for the Dolphins last year. Like he went to a place with a quarterback that was injury prone and he got to play and he's he got to prove that he was valuable to the Dolphins he is still on their roster Brock Purdy obviously I don't know that there's a quarterback that has ever ended up in a more perfect tailor-made situation for just anybody that plays the position anybody that that breathes I could play quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers right now and they could still succeed which by the way real quick I just saw that they're bringing pros versus Joe's back I want to I want to do pros versus Joe's against Brock Purdy and I want to have the San Francisco 49ers offense with me. And that way I can prove that Brock Purdy is a fraud in the NFL. See, I'll take another layer of that. I, I think Brock Purdy is being boosted by his offense to a degree, uh, a, a large degree too, probably. But I also think this is a sign of Brock Purdy was a lot better than we knew. And that Iowa State offense is just that bad. Yeah. Or or the coaches on that side of the ball are just that bad. Who's 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 their coach at Iowa State? Uh, so Matt Matt Campbell. Oh, okay. Campbell. Okay. Campbell. All right. Yeah. There you go. Matt Campbell. <laughs> that guy. All right. Uh, let's move on. Defensively, I mean, you just wrote about it today, but Khalid Duke, it may some surprise some people. Drew. Leads the Big Twelve. Or Drew wrote about it. Yeah, you were talking about it. Uh Khalid Duke leads the Big Twelve in sacks after the first four weeks of the season. I would imagine he's probably your defensive MVP so far. Yes. Let me go through it here. Um, I mean, I, my my pick, I guess, would probably still be Austin Moore just because I think of how integral he is to the defense. And it really hasn't changed for him. Just It, it seems like the ball is there. He's going to be there. Uh, maybe not as potent so far this year as he was last year, but I still think he's been pretty important to to the defense. I. It's tough to pick out an individual, though, for them because, like we've talked about, they've, they've been a little bit underwhelming. Yeah. Desmond Purnell was a star in the last game. Mm-hmm. So he's probably trending towards it. But the, you know, he had probably had a, a ramping up point to get to that level of performance. Like the body of work isn't necessarily 
there yet. No safety. Probably no corner. Will Lee was doing well. Mm-hmm. Got a little sideways against UCF. Willie would be number four on my list, I, I think, or a f- tied for four. So my no- my number one will be Khalid Duke. My number two would be Brendan Mott, actually. My number three would be Austin Moore, and four a tie between Willie and Desmond Purnell. And I'm probably undervaluing the nose guards a little bit here as well. Um they haven't been a liability, but I thought they were less splashier the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I I think it's tough too because that is like a that's like a unit as a whole. Obviously, Uso is the leader there with the nose guards, and and he was really good to start the season. And then Damian Elalio was maybe more ready than we we would have thought to contribute. And Javon Banks seemed like the buzz was really low on him going into the season, and then he got out on the field, and it was like, oh, he. He's even pr- providing something to this group, um, but I just think that's more of like a unit thing. So I, I couldn't fault any of uh, the the laddering that you do with the the defensive MVPs because I mean they've been they've been good up front, and I I mean I really like Brendan Mott. I think very highly of him. Um, I think last year, you know, next to, to Felix, he was probably the second best pass rusher on last year's team and made a lot of impactful plays, and is starting to do it again this year. So. Um, I, I won't I won't bemoan any of that. Uh, moving on, then, any surprises on the team this year, good or bad for you, that uh, may be shocking in the way things have turned out? You, you talked about nose guards. They obviously had a really hot start to the season. Um, but is it, there anything in particular that is notable? No. I mean, a lot of people would probably say, like, what happened to the secondary? But I kind of foreshadowed that. Yeah. So that, that didn't stun me. A little bit slower start for Kobe Savage than I thought, but he's starting to kick it up a little bit. So maybe that's an area where I would go. And Will Lee, maybe a faster start than I anticipated. So those are probably two of my takeaways on that side of the field. Offensively, slower starts the offensive line. I think that's probably the surprise because they were better against the better competition. So, yeah. <laughs> let's say if you want to put it that way. Receivers Keegan, but it's health related. I I would say this uh, on a on a good surprise, uh the the amount and I've said it a couple times, but the amount of guys that I have belief in for K-State that they can go out and and catch a ball and be reliable to catch a ball is higher than last year's team. I think that is a benefit. I think the way Jaden Jackson has played so far this year has been That's a good surprise, one, of, yeah. one of the best surprises for them is that he's a legitimate receiver to, to have out there and in a rotation because I think it was questionable on who else would be able to make that cut. Um, they just, you know, they're just guys that right now aren't capable of making plays down the field, but the Colin Klein has still found a way to make this offense work with it. So, I would throw that I would throw that out there as a surprise. I don't know if there have been any others maybe that have you know alarmed me or, or taken me. Special teams. Yeah, I I haven't been, but I wasn't high on special teams coming into the year, at least in terms of like the return game. Like okay. Philip Brooks, yeah. Philip Brooks has always been like he's got the the punt returns in his career, but if he's not if he hasn't taken it back to the house, he's been pretty lackluster. And honestly. You know, I'm sure somebody's got some advanced stat and they would d- disagree with this, but I feel like when he has not taken a kick back to the house, Philip Brooks has been very below average as a kick returner where he doesn't get very far. He muffs more punts than you would like. Yeah, he does, but he's got a few kick returns this year. Have been nice, though. Yeah, he, yeah, he's been better than I thought. And, uh, you know, Keegan Johnson stole the one from him, but Keegan had a decent return uh, on Saturday against UCF. But, yeah, a special teams. And I – you know, Chris Tennant struggles don't necessarily catch me by surprise. I mean, no. I would put them in the category of a disappointment, but I was, will- I, I, with my predictions this year, I was willing him trying to will him across the finish line. Well, you quit talking about him. And so he, he's like, ah, I don't have my, my biggest supporter anymore. Yeah. That's uh we'll see. I think he'll get the Oklahoma state game, but yeah, shortly. 
I I think so. I mean, that's that's one of the things right now that uh, is probably worth bringing up. I mean, I think if things don't get fixed in a hurry, there, that's where you just you, you cut the loss and you say this isn't going to happen. We have to be ready to move on to to somebody different and and maintain that. And unfortunately for them, they don't have Ty Zentner waiting there. Who although his his kicking career was light and not very good. Like I pointed out all last year, he was not a good place kicker at Butler. Like he, he struggled there. The numbers were not awe inspiring, but he at least had experience. He had done a lot of other things, kicking the football at a high level while at K state and had experience and it translated and it worked out. So he had the confidence and, and he was around a long time. Now, if you have to move off Chris Tennant, you're handing it off to, a bunch of freshmen and and who are you going to pick out of that group? So uh, well, I, I, they'd be late and simmering, right? That'd be the guy, yeah. but it's more so. You, you would, would you cut? Would you cut the cord now? I wouldn't. I would still. No, I wouldn't. To do it. I wouldn't do it now. I'd hang no. on. I, you know, obviously alarming. I don't even care so much about the the one missed extra point. That's going to happen. You know, uh, like see, that's what pissed climbing up the most. I think. Yeah, I don't know. Like it's one he, point because he's know? missed. Because he's missed how many of those now? Yeah, I mean he's he's missed some in his career from that distance. But I, the concerning one is that the field goal didn't really have much of a chance. And I don't know. You you give him. You I, give don't him even, the I don't. I don't care. Oklahoma State game, and maybe we should care about this one because it was supposed to be his forte. But like the fifty-four yarder, it was just short. It was just perfect. No, that long. one. That uh, see that though. The wind was going in that direction. Like the wind was helping. We've heard all about the leg. That one, that one doesn't sit well with me either. I, I, I just think that there have been some moments where I think he's been better this year than what you know led to the benching last year, obviously. But yeah. it, it's just there's still some things that got to get corrected. And I don't know. I mean, uh, throw. This is a topic that came up when I talked to, to Scott yesterday, and I'll, I'll use it here again. But. It's one of those deals that when a guy like a kicker loses it, it's just gone. I Very timely. So Tuesday night. Like yeah. Well, so Tuesday night I was watching uh, the, the September episode of Real Sports on HBO, and they did a segment on kickers. So they talked to Roberto Aguayo, the former Florida State kicker that just tanked the second he made the Buccaneers roster as a second-round pick. They talked to Nate Kading, the former Chargers kicker, that had a disastrous 2010 playoff game. Um, I'm trying to think who else they had talked to. Him. But they talked to these guys and just, you know, hey, it, it it was gone. And from that point, like, they never had their career again. And it's also the same thing with, like, a golfer. And Chris Kleiman has used the golf analogy a couple of times. And even though, you know, a lot of times you can get it back if you got the yips or you got some kind of problem, there are some guys that it's it's gone and it never comes back. I mean, David Duvall was one of the best golfers in the world, like legitimately pushing Tiger for number one. And he lost it and it never came back. And it, he's, you know, even when he's teed it up as a guy with zero expectations in, you know, his last go round at like the open, it looks like a guy that is just can't do it. Like some of these old guys, they look like they can still play. They know what they're doing. He can't do it. And I just think it's the same thing with kickers that once they're gone, you have to admit that they're gone and it's not coming back. And it's, it's unfortunate. Like it, it's a terrible spot for, for Chris Tennant. And I feel bad for him. Like I think people should feel bad for kickers in a lot of ways. Like it's a tough job and the, the volatility that comes with your job security is a lot lesser than a lot of other positions because you only have one way that you can keep your job. Like we're talking about with Will Howard he can do a lot of things to keep his job despite being bad. You can't really hide as a kicker uh, with all that. So I think, you know, you give the Oklahoma State game, and if he misses an extra point, whatever, don't care, uh, move on. If you're so worried about extra points, say we've got a great offensive line or we're supposed to, we got good running backs, we've got a quarterback that could be an all-Big 12 guy, uh, maybe you go for two a little bit more. But – it's the field goals that are going to be more costly. And so um, I don't want to see K-State kicking a ton of field goals against Oklahoma State next week. But if they could get one or two and see if there's some confidence that Chris Tennant could build back up, and honestly, confidence that could be built back into the fan base and the coaching staff, that would probably be beneficial. Uh, 
I, I was thinking of like pitchers that kind of lose it. And you remember, I don't, maybe this is, maybe I'm revealing my age a little bit, but John Rocker uh, <laughs> went off as Rocker, couldn't throw strikes anymore. Um, and in the 90s, baseball was like my first love. And something that blew me away, I mean, this guy was one of the best closers in the game for multiple seasons during the Atlanta Braves dynasty when they won the National League East, like every year. Mark Woolers, one of the best closers. Then, like, that dude couldn't even throw at the home plate to save his life at one point. Yeah, well, I feel like John Rocker was like a psychopath too, right? Like, he was a pretty crazy dude. Am I getting that wrong? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, no, and he would – He'd be one of those guys like the sprint from the the bullpen, I think, and like, yeah, he had a he had a pre like a routine that even looked bizarre. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, he's yeah he's made some bad comments uh, in his in his life. He also uh, used steroids. I mean, the guy that I would have thrown out there that I think of like baseball wise is Rick Ankiel, but yeah. Rick Ankiel he. He's more like a quarterback where he he was really bad and, and but he guess what he he found out he could hit with maybe the help of steroids and uh, <laughs> allegedly whatever uh, but like he was able to say, salvage his career and and come back as a hitter but uh, I don't think Chris Tennant if the struggles continue is going to be coming back as like a right tackle or something I think uh, it's the it's end. kicking or bust the end oh yeah wiry guy you know we'll see. Uh, I don't know. That That is a big thing. And honestly, at this stage, with everything else seeming like it's probably getting better, um, the special teams thing is probably the biggest story moving forward for K-State because you have multiple areas that are a concern right now. We agree. All right, let's roll on. Uh, expectations the rest of the way. I mean, K-State's 3-1 and one right now and 1-0 and oh in Big 12 play. If you had to to go out and amend any preseason prediction, how do you anticipate the rest of the season going from here? And, and what would like a record be that stands out to you? What what should K State be? Not what you think they'll be. What should they be with what's left in front of them? Because I think that's the better question. Not well, you know, I think that they they'll probably slip up here and they'll do this. What should K State be with the way they're playing versus what's left on their schedule? Well, they should beat Oklahoma State even in Stillwater. I still think at Lubbock is a weird place to play, and so that one gets a little interesting. You you think you'd like to take care of business at home because it's not, like, so undoable. You still have to play TCU, Houston, Baylor, and Iowa State at home. Win all yeah. of those. I mean, you win all those, and you're probably sitting – pretty at that point. I mean, because that, that gets you to eight wins, take Oklahoma State, that's nine. And then you hope you can beat KU. Um, trickier game than we even thought before the season, I'm sure. So that would be 10. And that leaves you with Tech in Texas. It's yep. such a manageable schedule. It's, that's yep. what I'm going to say. Especially if you take care of business at home because you have what – you have four home games left or five? Yeah, four four home games. Yeah. TCU, Houston, Baylor, Iowa State, take care of it. Yeah. Right? That's Oklahoma State is probably your weakest road game left. Take care of it. Yeah. Now, the issue becomes if, you know, like you're saying here, and I, I side with you. I mean, I look at this. K-State is going to be the better team or have the better circumstance in seven of their final eight games right now, at least how I see it. Now, The game in Lawrence could be the one tricky one there. And maybe Texas Tech looks better over the next two weeks and and the mindset's different when K-State goes down there. But, uh, I mean, this is a K-State team that still should probably be in Arlington and will have every chance to do so. The only issue is going to be how things play out around the rest of the league. And because K-State has an advantageous schedule, Oklahoma and Texas do as well. And that's even with teams that had probably better looking schedules in terms of how friendly they were before the season started. They've gotten even more so that way. I mean, you look at Oklahoma, their two toughest games left are Texas and at Kansas um, outside. And then, you know, the third one would probably be a home game with TCU they have at the end of the year. So that's. Yeah. I mean, it's going to come down like Texas is getting Arlington. I'm just. Yeah. 
convince myself of that at this point. It's going to come down to between like Oklahoma, K State, who who avoids the hiccup? Because yeah. one of those teams is probably losing. They're probably both losing to Texas, mm-hmm. and then one of them probably losing another game where it doesn't feel like they should. Honestly, it comes down to out of K State and Oklahoma, who has the more Texas like season this year? Where Texas isn't going to be Texas this year. It's up to somebody else to do it. And so for whoever blinks between K State and Oklahoma and they play the role of Texas, it's you should have been in Arlington, but you yeah. lost this game to, you know, BYU if you're Oklahoma or if you're K State, you lost this game to, you know, Houston. Like, where is that going to to fall? And you just want to be the team that doesn't have that happen. Yeah, no, I agree. And I'm going to throw a hypothetical out at you because the more I look at this, the more I think this hypothetical comes into play. And it was the hypothetical that I think some people threw at me to begin the season or just before the season. And I rolled my eye because I was like, that's stupid. Like you don't yeah. have to, you don't have to pick between the two. But if Kansas State makes it to Arlington but loses to Kansas, how do you feel? <laughs> Uh, they better win in Arlington then if they're going to, if they're going to lose that game. Uh, I just, I don't know. That's, I think here, here's how I've said it. It's that is, that's going, it is possible. There's no doubt. I mean, that honestly, to me after Texas, that is the toughest game left on the schedule. I think that is going to be, you know, a, a great environment whenever it gets played, wh- whatever time of day it is. The way I look at it though, is this like, Losing to Kansas is never fun for anybody in K-State circles, but this is going to be particularly hard whenever it happens. It could be this year. It could be 10 years from now. Whenever Kansas finally wins that game again, it's going to be double the pain of anything you've ever felt because there are a lot of people alive right now that don't really know what it's like to lose to KU. I mean, I was born in 1998 to, to two parents that went to K-State So my entire life, all 25 years, has been about the Wildcats. In my lifetime, K-State has only lost four times to KU. Only one of those is when Bill Snyder or Chris Kleiman is the head coach. Three of them under Ron Prince. I was in like third, fourth, and fifth grade. Did not impact me whatsoever. I mean, you know, it, it sucked. I hated it. But I was playing like fourth grade football, so I would hear the score update during the game. It was just like, yeah, Ron Prince blows, whatever. This would be a a really, really, really not fun position. And there are people that are older than me that they have more wins with the same amount of losses on there. It's just, it's going to be such a painful thing because there are going to be a lot of people walking around like, I don't know how to handle this because I haven't had to handle it at all. Um, So yeah, I I think if you had to pick one of those, you better attach that K-State's winning once they get to Arlington. I think that's probably a sacrifice you're willing to make as much as it would suck. But yeah, I, I think you do do that. Now, if you're telling me, hey, you get to go to Arlington, but you lose to Texas again, I would say that's that doesn't sound like fun at all. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, wh- whatever. You know, I I don't know. Those are all so tough and everybody can have their own opinions and can er, both can be right. Uh, I just know that uh, in my lifetime, it, it will suck to lose the KU whenever it happens again, uh, if you're a K-Stater. You're the better Kansas State historian, so I'm going to uh, bump this volleyball back to you again. By far, and obviously this isn't up for debate or able to be contended, this is the toughest Sunflower Showdown for Kansas State to win since I've covered the team. And I, I've covered the team since 2017. I don't know. Like, 2018 was really tough for them. Well, well, it was. It shouldn't have been. Yeah. <laughs> it was, but it shouldn't have been. Um, and last year was – I don't know that 40 – it didn't really feel like 47-27. And for Kansas State to win that game that way was impressive. I actually mm-hmm. think – beating that KU team that wanted it that badly by 20 points last year was was pretty good. But it was in Manhattan this year. It is in Lawrence. So I, I don't think that's – yeah, I don't think that's a, a silly thing to say. I think it's a slam dunk that this is yeah. the most 
the toughest I mean, one for Kansas State to win in my time covering the team, which is 2017. So for you, the question I asked, <laughs> when is the last time that it, that you think it was this tough to win the Sunflower Showdown? Well, uh, I it would probably be – I, I guess you got, would you have I to guess say you're, it, you actually lost? I guess – well, you could say that, but, like, I don't know. I think if you go into the game as, like, the the underdog, the expected underdog, then it, it probably doesn't count. Um, so I think the answer is probably the 2009 game. I mean, that was a 17-10 game, and KU still had a bunch of guys on offense that were really, really talented. I mean, Todd Reesing was still the quarterback. Jake Sharp was still the running back. Um Kerry Meyer and Desmond Briscoe were, were still catching balls. So it's that it's definitely that team. I mean, that was Snyder's first year back. And you think about what Snyder was doing it with in that game. I mean, it that was that was Grant Gregory Carson Kaufman team. Like here, let me read this to you, DY. This is this is the leading passer in, in that game for K-State. Grant Gregory, seven of sixteen for sixty-six yards. That's how K-State won that game. Uh, now Daniel Thomas did run for 185 that day, um, but that was that was still a really good team. And I mean, Daryl Stuckey was on that team still for KU, so um, that that would be the answer. That's the last time it was that tough for K State to win it, and it was the year that they re they rebooted a streak against the Jayhawks. So, and and you did mention 2018, which was a close game. So I guess yeah, you could say that, but but that was because Kansas State was deteriorating so so much. <laughs> And, yeah. and also, like, they had no – even then, they still had no business being within that close of a margin with KU. Yeah. They but, hey, South Dakota that year. hey, Alex Dalton got his uh, his version of a Heisman moment in my mind. You know, running in for that touchdown to take the lead. Oh, man. I will say, I mean, I was wrestling with thoughts during that game. Like, I'm going to have to witness this. It's going to happen right here. It cannot happen. It cannot happen. And it didn't happen, fortunately. And here's really? what I will say. I'm with you on last year's game, 47-27. Like, I don't know. I assume you feel like it felt closer than that last year um, and how that was still kind of an impressive margin. I, th- I thought it was kind of and – and they still cruised. But yeah. It was – they they were always at arm's length. Yeah, they still cruised. Maybe it's because I watched that game for the first time and I was like, KU's getting better. Like, it, yes. was, it was so visible for the first time that KU was getting better. Yeah, and I mean, you look last year, out of KU's losses, K-State beat KU by 20 points. Um, that was the worst loss that KU had all year, aside from that Texas game. Um, so Texas and K-State were the only ones to beat KU that badly last year. And before Jalen Daniels got hurt, I mean, you know how things worked out, but like they were they were in all of these games they played until they kind of mailed it in at the end of the year. I mean, that was kind of the, the noise out of Lawrence was – the team got to their sixth win and they just kind of settled. But then obviously the K-State game is of, you know, importance there and they they put it on. And I think this year it's a lot different because this KU team probably feels like they can achieve a lot more. And you look at what is on KU's schedule moving forward in the Big 12. I mean, after this weekend in in Austin, um, they're going to play more teams, probably match up and, and have a tighter game with them. I mean, UCF, Oklahoma, Texas Tech, and K-State. But those are going to be the four toughest games left after Texas. All of those are in Lawrence this year. Their road games left are at Oklahoma State, at Iowa State, and at Cincinnati at the end of the year. I mean, this is a KU team that's probably going to have a pretty respectable record when K-State goes to Lawrence the next last game of the season. I feel that way. Although, at Iowa State, that's just a trickier matchup for them, in my opinion. Yeah. Because Iowa State can keep KU off the scoreboard. So, that's true. And they're the home team, so maybe they're – Offense can rise up. That's an interesting matchup for KU, just having to go to Ames with the way the Cyclones are constructed. I, I looked up 2018 just to kind of see everything. Boy, I, I guess I do. I, I knew it in real time, but I guess reflecting, it's just like I can't believe how badly that season ended because yeah, yeah. You, you had the like the miracle win over Oklahoma State. Obviously, no, that was a different. 17 was the mere corner yeah. of Oklahoma State. Mm-hmm. So you beat Oklahoma State 31 to 12 at home. Your last five games, you get absolutely blasted by Oklahoma and Norman, where you give up 51 points. Yeah, and it, I was it sick prob- that weekend. And it probably could have been 80. Like that was that was ugly. You lose to TCU 14 to 13 in Fort Worth, 
which was probably the most boring game I've ever seen in my entire life. Literally nothing yeah. happened at that game. Hey, Bill wait, Snyder that was Malik Knowles team. coming out party though, right? Didn't Malik Knowles catch a touchdown pass? Uh, maybe that was the myself. game where Bill, yes, Bill Snyder, uh, Bill Snyder blamed the game on Isaiah Zuber. I do remember. <laughs> well, he did lose a fumble, so. Uh... And then you barely beat KU, as we said, mm-hmm. 21-17. Uh, 21-17 over KU in 2018 is so disgusting. Yeah, but, after uh, David Beatty had already been fired. Yeah, that is so and disgusting. And it was 3 nothing KU at halftime. 3 nothing still- KU at halftime. 3 nothing KU. That was so disgusting. Somehow, after all that, you still blast Texas Tech. <laughs> That's Kansas State's own Texas Tech for yeah. Uh, ever since I covered the beat, like you 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 win a disgusting game with KU, you lose the most boring game ever against TCU, you get blasted by Oklahoma. But as t- true as tales time, you still blast Texas Tech. Yeah, and then you finish by losing like a twenty eight point lead in Ames. Yeah. That uh that season is wild because that team went five and seven and you look at it, they easily could have been like eight and four, but they also could have been like three and nine <laughs> the way this such, season it, it was that was such a a I don't want to say entertaining, but a dramatic five and seven team. <laughs> it was, it really was. Uh yeah. I mean Bill Snyder at least didn't make it boring on the way out there. All right. Uh, let's roll on and uh, some Friday regulars here. It's time for best bets as we take a look around. We give our uh, picks uh, for what we think are maybe some of the best bets of the weekend. I will be transparent. I was terrible last weekend. Did not go my way. I was high on the Beavs. They lost. I apologize to Washington State for saying that they are a fake good team. Uh, <laughs> USC, I mean, everybody had beaten Arizona State poorly, even bad teams like Oklahoma State. Yet, for some reason, the, the Trojans were not ready for Scadaboo, the Sac State transfer, to, to get them going. And maybe it just took Drew Pine playing for Arizona State. Uh, and then Avery Johnson didn't even see a snap. So it was a bad three games for me. D.Y., however, had a pretty good go of it. The only one that you ended up missing out on uh, was you had UConn to cover against Duke. That did not go well uh, at all. <laughs> like from the get go, <laughs> that that never had a chance. Yeah, no. That never uh, but uh, you, first quarter over twelve and a half. Like if that continues to be the line, that may be what's a pound in Kansas State games all year. Yeah, I I look. I got on it after you suggested it, and sure enough, you know, it's one of those deals where it's like, man, I'm not really rooting for UCF to score on this drive, but uh, if they could, like that'd be fine. And they did. And then uh, you had FSU minus two and a half, and they ended up getting a Thanks touchdown to win <laughs> Thanks to overtime. Overtime. uh so here are this week's best bets dy now three and three since we started keeping track i am one and five that's not <laughs> fun uh real quick here's what i'm going this week uh yet again somebody's trying to pick against the duke blue devils i'm taking <laughs> notre dame minus five and a half uh, look normally i think notre dame is is a bunch of frauds but i've thought this year they might be more of the real deal than ever before and even though they lost to ohio state i still like what i saw I think they should be a touchdown better than Duke, uh, even though Duke is maybe a fine team. I think Notre Dame is legit. They're going to be pissed off. They're going to want to win. And I bet that every single snap they have 11 guys on the field this week. So uh, Notre Dame over under 10 and a half players on the field every play. I'm taking the over this week. Uh, my second one, I'm taking Fresno State minus 24 and a half again. At it. it is a big line, but Fresno State has played some really bad teams this year and they've gone ahead and still covered and beat them poorly. I mean, the defense has been there. They've also been ready to go from an offensive standpoint. They beat Arizona State 29 to nothing. They beat Kent State 53 to 10. Nevada is in the same vein as those two previous schools. I think that F- uh, that Fresno State keeps it rolling, so I'll take the Bulldogs minus 24 and a half. And then speaking of teams that are typically bad and deserve no respect, Vanderbilt. Uh look, it might feel a little dirty going uh, going and riding a team that beat K-State, but Kentucky just handled covering against Vanderbilt last week in Nashville. I think it's Missouri's turn. Uh, they should win that game by two touchdowns because Missouri's got the defense to lock down the Commodores, and Vanderbilt has given up a lot of points on defense to teams that I don't think are very good. And uh, Missouri obviously has the skill position guys to make some things happen. So those are my three picks for the week. 
uh, you can you can attack away at, at what you see there, D.Y. See, Oregon, I got that total team total under 44 and a half. Look, Oregon was pissed off clearly at the whole Colorado uh, scene and took that <laughs> personal, for lack of a better term, and really got up for that game. Now they had to come back and play at Stanford, I believe. Um, and that was where, like, you go from like a, a pepped up game to maybe the most boring atmosphere in college football. And you scored 42 last week on Colorado. And Stanford probably is a better defense than, than Colorado. Um, that's at least my understanding. And at the same time, if Dan Lanning's willing to call off the dogs against the team that he basically bitched at for an <laughs> yeah. entire week, then I could see him calling off the dogs against Stanford if it were to come to that. Now, I could get into some trouble. If Stanford were to score some points, I just don't think they can. So I, I really feel good about that one. Um, Arizona plus 18. Look, Arizona barely beat Stanford last week, and I think Arizona is a much better team than Stanford. Probably looking ahead to this game, they, they're at home. They can really score some points. And Washington gave up some points a little bit last week, and I think this is a game that they can kind of, you know, potentially look over, you know, after – having a big game last week. They have a big game next week. So I think this is a good spot to ride Arizona. They have a good offense as well. Texas Tech, uh, look, there, there's no better team to get right against than Houston. So mm -hmm. Texas Tech coming home, I, I think they really take out their frustrations of the entire year and ride behind Bear Morton and a, a bit of a win one for the Gipper game at home and just blast Houston into oblivion. And also I think that, uh, what I saw, tech may that may even be down to eight and a half now. So uh, yeah. you could you could I mean that might scare you I guess if it's going down, but uh, <laughs> you could get a better number than ten at this point in time possibly. Uh, look, Washington, you're right. They did give up some points last week. You know how I know that? Uh, that's because I had Washington to cover, and I was banking on a bunch of scrubs to keep <laughs> keep that going last week. Uh, they they did. I mean, some big touchdowns from the scrubs there at the end, and then. I mean, just willing to roll over last week um, at the end of the game. So that was that was beneficial. So shout out to uh, to Cal and Justin Wilcox. I I said after uh, that bet hit late Saturday night into Sunday morning, I was like, all right, I'll buy a Cal shirt. They won me money. I'll buy a Cal shirt. I went and looked. They have the worst selection because they just switched over from Under Armour to Nike. There is nothing there. I mean, Under Armour doesn't make anything. Meanwhile, Nike still is having to try and produce stuff. So. I'm not getting a Cal shirt now, but thank you to the Golden Bears for not trying to score at the end of the game. Uh, I like them. I, you know, we'll see on Washington and Arizona. Uh, uh, that'll be. Game. I don't know how to feel about that game, but I like your logic there. Uh, I also like the logic on Oregon, where you're. You're right. If Dan Lanning was going to roll over to Colorado, then he'll probably roll over to about anybody else. Yes, uh, I, I like Duke money line this week, so I was kind of uh -oh. against you on that. Uh oh. So. I, I also like NC State money line on a Friday night against Louisville. As a they're an underdog, I think at home. Um, uh, well, let's let's get into it. Talking about Fridays and home underdogs, the first Big Twelve game of the week is Cincinnati BYU on Friday night. BYU is a home underdog right now. Yeah, so maybe that's a team to jump on. I also took Cal minus twelve against Arizona State because Arizona State probably blew their wad against USC. Yeah, so. Like that. TCU, I also took – you see TCU's there against West Virginia at home. I actually have a bet in that game. I like the TCU to score under 32.5 points. They're coming off kind of an emotional rivalry, which is, you know, the iron skill game with SMU. You get to play West Virginia. I think that's a lot of points, 32.5 for the Frogs, especially since West Virginia under Neil Brown, typically better on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I, I I agree with you on that. I you know I think West Virginia. I mean they're better than we thought. They'll lose to TCU, um, but it, it won't be like a a butt kicking by any means. Uh, other games around the league. Look, you're you're playing on FS2, Houston and Texas Tech. That's not the most entertaining thing in the world. Uh, but I, I am intrigued by that game because this is going to be a big like this is going to be big for Texas Tech if they can't get right against Houston at home. They've got serious problems. I'm not interested at all in Iowa State at Oklahoma. That is just not going to be a fun thing. Uh, 
And then really the only game that's legitimately good this weekend is KU Texas, just to see uh, where the intrigue lies there. But for having, you know, two teams off and everything else going on, it's not the most exciting week in the Big 12. This is like a, a Big 12 sickos week. Like you really have to love the league to uh, get into a lot of these games. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I am interested a little bit in Oklahoma, but also Texas, just to see what those two teams do yeah. the week before they have to play one another. That's true. And I think we talked about it earlier in the week, but if one of those teams were to slip up this week, we're pretty confident it would be Oklahoma. We don't think it'll be Texas. And Iowa State, now it's in Norman, so maybe mm -hmm. you can't. Hey, that's where Everyone, Matt Campbell got his first big win, though. Yeah, so the, if, if their defense plays an A game, I think they can stop Oklahoma. Yeah. All right, well, we'll see. It'll be a, a fun weekend, I guess, for us because we don't have to go cover a game, so we just get to absorb all of the football. Kind of the same but, thing next weekend, too, with the Friday game. Yeah, because it, it's an early week, though, so our coverage will start sooner. It's true. That is true. Uh, the next time that you will hear from anybody here on the, the K-State Online YouTube and podcast platforms will be Sunday. Drew Fan and I will be back. We'll have a show just like any other regular Sunday. It just won't be recapping a game. We'll be setting the stage for K-State and Oklahoma State. Then D.Y. and I back on Monday. And plenty of great stuff coming over on, on 3 and K-State Online uh, throughout the weekend. You're a baseball nerd. So I do have to ask you what the playoffs about to start. Who are you riding with on in the National League and the American League? Uh, I mean, great questions. National League, soft spot. Uh, I'm really pulling for the, the the Miami Marlins right now to get the last wild card spot. Can't stand the Cubs. Like, whatever. I, the Cubs are – baseball's better when the Cubs are losing. They're kind of a hateable – the World Series for the National League? What? Who do you think goes to the World Series? For uh, Atlanta. So, they're, yeah. just, they're just so good. They are, but I really don't want them up, like because of my wallet a little bit here, because I got a bit of a future. I'm really going to be hoping for the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah, um, I, w I mean, really. So the the team that I always like in there is Milwaukee as well. Um, I feel a little bit connection there. Obviously, a very tiny market, just like Kansas City, and you know the Brewers, the name, the the unis. I love that ballpark. And then, you know, when they first started making the playoffs, again, they had a couple of former Royals with Lorenzo Cain and Mike Moustakis, so that was fun. Uh, so, you know, I always kind of have a soft spot for the Brewers. In the American League, I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's the Orioles. That's the team that I'm I'm rocking and riding with. Uh, also, you know, kind of pulling for the Blue Jays, only because at the start of the season, I took a future ticket on the Blue Jays to win the World Series. I was high on Toronto at the start of the year, and uh, some of the reasons I was high on them kind of fell apart. But, you know, I'm interested in, in seeing how that plays out. If Basically, if you're from the American League East and you're not the Yankees or Red Sox, I like you because you're not the Yankees or Red Sox. So that's where I lie. And then, you know, maybe I don't have any problems with the AL outside of Minnesota and Houston. Everybody else is fine. Do whatever you want to do. But – Minnesota and Houston kick rocks. Yeah, I'm really that way on the Twins, too. But the Phillies would be good for me. Are the Mariners even going to make the playoffs? They could. Uh, they, they're going to have a uh, they're going to have a big finish this weekend. They, they're, I think, a game and a half behind Houston for the last wild card spot right now as we record this. This is Thursday yeah. afternoon we're doing this. So, yeah, they're a, a game and a half out. I have a dart throw on Seattle before the year even began. So. Yeah, the Mariners, they finish up with four against Texas in Seattle. Uh, Houston is going to be finishing with, uh, it looks like, four at home or four or three on the road at Arizona starting Friday. And Arizona is a team that I don't know if they've clinched yet, but they are in a wild card spot in the National League. So it's not like the Diamondbacks are going to roll over. And that's a team. Shout out to Tori Lovello for what he's done this year and getting that team into the postseason. Um, cause that's not the second NL West team that people would have anticipated being in, but I love postseason baseball. Can't wait for it. Mixing it in. It, that's a great time of year where we've got football on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then baseball to kind of supplement the rest of the week. So I'm looking forward to it, but 
That's enough from us. We will get out of here. Make sure you are locked into everything going on at K-State Online and follow along with each and everything that Drew, D.Y., and myself have going on over there. And we will be back on Sunday with the Sunday Show with myself, Drew, and Fan. For now, thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online.